Great. Well, I'm uh, Matthew Goodwin from Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon uh, focusing mainly on spinal tumors. And I'm here with my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Wendy Gibbs. I'm Wendy Gibbs from Barrow Neurological Institute in Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm a diagnostic and interventional radiologist. And today we're going to talk about cervical nerve root injections. And um, we've talked about this before a little bit, um, but I am very excited to talk to you because you're not a spine surgeon. And one of the things that I've uh, tried to learn is, or one of the things I learned from Dan Shuba was whenever he was around people that was, didn't do exactly what he did, he would always pay attention to what they know about their specialty and absorb it. And so uh, it's always great to talk to somebody uh, that does the thing that we're always ordering or asking people to do. So to start with, um, just in terms of collaboration with surgeons and your role, um, I'd love to hear things uh, that you think about when you're working with surgeons in terms of things we do that drive you crazy, <laughs> uh, things we order that don't make any sense uh, or, or anything of that nature. Well, I'm going to disappoint you with my answer to that question, because I've been very fortunate to always have great collaborative neurosurgeons to work with. So I did two years of neuroradiology fellowship at Barrow, where the surgeons are fantastic, but they are also very supportive and work very closely with radiology and the other specialties. And then, you know, I haven't been in practice that long, but um, I noticed right away when I got into my first job that in my area of interest, which is spine oncology, like you, it was already well established that multidisciplinary care was kind of the norm and the best way to get good outcomes for patients. So I've always worked very closely with the surgeons. And as far as my procedures, I've also had good relationships with the surgeons. It's nice to be able to talk to them if there's a kind of a hard case, a complicated case, discuss it with them after the procedure, maybe discuss the outcome. So I don't have anything that drives me crazy. You're so polished. I... You're, so, you're so polished. <laughs> So I guess, so we can learn and I can learn, the, when I order a cervical nerve root injection, I might do that for somebody with radicular pain, maybe with a small herniation, maybe I think that's the issue, maybe we haven't done anything non-operative. Um, when I order a cervical nerve root injection, I guess maybe we can start with even just talking about the difference between maybe a, a transforaminal epidural injection versus a selective nerve root block. You know, does it matter? And, and maybe we just go from there. Yeah, and so this is something um, that is kind of very important for me. A lot of our colleagues in NAS do, a, do pain management, and that is their whole job. Because I'm actually more of a diagnostic neuroradiologist, so the procedures I do all come from surgical consultation. I don't have a clinic. I don't, you know, I don't do just pain. So for me, the difference is very, very stark. So epidural injections typically are therapeutic. So you inject a larger volume, you get pain relief from that injectate moving, moving to different levels, mm -hmm. multiple levels. Whereas if I am doing a workup for a patient that you're going to do surgery on. I just want to target one nerve. So like you said, you might think it's C6 that's the problem. But, you know, it's a little bit confusing, you know, whether it's clear from the images or not, or that, you know, that maybe their exam is a little bit unclear. Right, right. I'm going to target C6 for you. And I'm not going to get any epidural spread or subdural or subarachnoid because that would confound the exam. So if they feel better from my nerve root block, which is that one nerve, then we'll know that is a positive data point for you that that is likely their problem. That is likely the level you want to address. So you will use some steroid, no steroid? So that, that's a good point, actually. So really for a nerve root block, you don't need to use steroid. I, in my practice, do. And I don't know, you know, this is just me. I don't know if there are any guidelines about this, but I like the patients to have some pain relief for as long as possible, because they might not get to have surgery or anything else for a while. Right. So I don't know if it's the anesthetic, the bupivacaine, or the steroid that's helping them. That's kind of, I don't know, there's some literature saying it could be either one, but I give them both just in case to give them the best shot. But in terms of the test, it doesn't really matter as long as they have the anesthetic and a positive or negative result to that. So when these are getting done, I know we've had discussions at our place and I've heard discussions other places in terms of um, imaging and how these are done and whether they're done under fluoroscopy or CT guidance, or, or what's the, uh, what's your preferred way and why, and, and yeah. enlighten me. 
So um, again, I, you know, I've been out of fellowship um, about seven years now or something like that. I, so I am in the era now where I managed to learn all my procedures with CT guidance. Fluoro guidance has been around forever and that's much more common, especially for people who have been in practice a long time. Um, all procedures can be done under either one, CT or fluoro. For me, when I'm doing cervical work, especially foraminal, where your vertebral artery is right in front of the nerve, and I'm getting right behind that nerve, very important right. real estate right there, especially at the upper cervical spine, C1-2. Under CT guidance or CT fluoroscopic guidance, which is what I use, I can see everything. So really, the, um, it, when you have done a number of these and you're somewhat practiced at them, the, the controversy, oh, well, under floral, we can do it faster, less radiation. Really, if you are experienced in either one, it's equivalent. Right. And for me, the advantage is it's equivalent time, it's equivalent radiation, but I can see exactly where the vert is, I can see where the nerve is, I can see where the spinal cord is. I'm not relying on just landmarks. Right. And right, again, right. in the cervical spine, especially important. And you do as high as OC1, yeah. C1, C1-2? So I do C1-2. That's a little bit more uncommon. Um, I have gotten referrals from a lot of people from different places because they are you know, they don't have radiologists maybe do that. Right. Um, it's not difficult. It's just that people aren't trained to do that. So C1-2, especially whether it's um, a cervical puncture, like for people who can't get a lumbar puncture to access the subarachnoid mm. space for CSF, whether it's a C2 nerve root block, whether it's a C1-2 facet for atlantoaxial osteoarthritis causing cervicogenic headache. All of those, again, because of the variable course of the vertebral artery, you know, that kind of guessing where that nerve is gonna be, everything else around there, having that CT guidance, being able to see, or if there's a question, even when the patient's on the table, it takes us two seconds to, they have an IV, Shoot some contrast up there. Contrast, right. It's a CTA, a CT angiogram. I can see exactly where every vessel right, is, so I'm right, not going right, to hit right. that vert and accidentally inject them in there. Right. So, right. so I think it's useful. It's maybe not 100. percent I yeah, some yeah, people out there might the, you know still do them under floral. I know they're done under floral, but I think for patient safety reasons, I would prefer to do it under CT. Under, gotcha. Yeah. You said earlier it's a data point, which I agree with 100. percent Right. When I'm working someone up. It's usually part of the process, particularly for radicular pain, um, depending on a variety of factors. But um, it's a data point. I also might have an EMG nerve conduction test. Um, I'm going to look at the imaging. I'm going to do an exam. How good do you think that data point is? Hmm. Is, it, is it the answer? You know, is it you do the selective nerve root block, and and in that first hour, they're like, that was it. The pain's gone. I mean, yeah. Uh yeah, no, and I think it's great that you do all of those things. If it's something as important as surgery, you want all the data you can get, right, like you right. said. So I think it's an important one, but I do think it goes with all the other tests that you're doing. Right. So that's a good answer for that. All right, well, we're going to be out of time soon. I want to ask you one more question, though. Um, <laughs> occasionally, somebody will get, uh, you'll think you're on to it. The rest of their neck looks pretty good. You have a little herniation. Looks like that's the one. They get no relief from the injection. Ooh, mm -hmm. And um, should they get another injection? Should I look at a different level? Do I need to review? So a lot of times I'll try to review the imaging that's been saved, if any's been saved, uh -huh. to make sure it's in the right spot. Oh, that's good. Um, yeah. But is there ever a time when it doesn't do much and you give it a second try? Or how do you, or is it, or is it once you've done it and you're sure you've, do, you've been there, it's mm -hmm. like, no, we, we shouldn't do that again. No, I think, I think that's a good idea because, um, you know, I've, I've had such great, the surgeons I've worked with have, that have referred them to me are so good at kind of knowing what it's going to be at a time. So they're almost, they almost always work. But I have had referrals where I say, you know, this person had one a couple weeks ago. It didn't work. Can you try it again? I'm really sure it's the C6 nerve or we know whatever. So I'll do it again and maybe it'll work or maybe it won't, but that does confirm it. And conversely, um, if it does work, because again, like, you know, you're a very careful surgeon. You want to make sure before you're going to fuse somebody that it's the right level or, you know, that you're treating the exact right thing. I would say even if it does work, repeating it in a couple of weeks is not a bad idea because sometimes patients, you know, they have this hopeful expectation mm -hmm. they're going to be helped. And you just want to make sure that everything they are perceiving is correct. Right. So right. I think both of those things are valid to repeat the test. Right. Excellent. 
Well, helpful. Always helpful. Always helpful talking to you about this stuff. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think that's. Uh, I think we're out of time for today. But uh, uh, thanks, obviously, for joining us and, and teaching us. And uh, look forward to more conversations. Thank you. Back to you. Okay.